Sunday afternoon, July 1st, 2007. In a quiet bedroom community just outside of Knoxville, Tennessee, relatives pulled up outside the home of 15-year-old Amanda McGee and her parents, Terry and Elisa. Family members have been trying to get a hold of Lisa McGee for a couple of days, and they grew very concerned because it wasn't like her not to return their phone calls. Elisa's silence was doubly unusual because her sister had given birth to twins just days before. I had my baby boys. My sister and Amanda were there with me that night. Lisa was so excited about the babies. She was going to the hospital every afternoon from work to see about them. But then for three days, silence. On Friday, I was released from the hospital. We were expecting Elisa to at least come or call. We didn't hear from her. And on Saturday, we didn't hear from her. About 1 o'clock on Sunday afternoon, I thought, oh, something's wrong. One of Elisa's cousins drove to the McGee house to check in with Elisa. She knocked and nobody answered. She went around to the other door to knock, and she could see enough through the glass, Elisa laying in the floor. A few quick phone calls brought both the sheriff's department and more of Elisa's family rushing to the scene. The family got there first. I came right down and my grandson was with me and I told him just go to the front and kick in the door. Inside, Linda Smith found her niece sprawled on the kitchen floor. She'd been shot. When I realized she was dead, I was screaming for Terry. Terry, come help me. You know, Terry, Terry, Amanda, you know, where are you? Terry couldn't help. Family members found him seconds later, still in bed. As you went back and opened the bedroom door of Terrence McGee's bedroom, you would see him laying in the bed, facing away from the door toward the wall with a, a gunshot wound to the head. But where was Amanda? Her aunt ran to the 15-year-old's room. I held the door knob for so long before I opened that door because I knew I was going to, I was thinking I was going to find Amanda in there dead. The room was empty, leaving both family and police to wonder, did the missing Amanda hold the key to solving her parents' murders? Amanda McGee grew up barely knowing her birth mother. My biological mom and I had no relationship. I didn't know her well enough to have a relationship. After her and my dad divorced when I was four, she didn't have no contact with me. Amanda's mother was a drug addict, and Terry felt the need to get Amanda out of that kind of situation. They divorced, and he became a single father. When Amanda was eight years old, her father began dating a 35-year-old accountant named Elisa Hackworth. I remember the first time they met, it was awesome. We went to Red Lobster, and I remember talking her ear off. He didn't have one word in edgewise, because I fell in love with her the first moment I seen her. The feeling was mutual. Elisa didn't have any children, and she loved children, and she immediately fell in love with Amanda. After a year of dating, Terry and Amanda soon moved in with Elisa. I believe that gave him hope for Amanda to have a typical girl's life. He needed somebody to help him with his little girl, and Lisa just seemed to be the right one. Amanda embraced her new mother from the start. She was always there for me. She helped me with my homework. She was a great mother figure to me. She always called her mom. She said, my mom this, my mom that. It was a, a, a perfect relationship, we thought. After four years of living together, Terry and Elisa decided to make their relationship official. Terry wanted to be married, so it was, you know, a family for Amanda. She, they wanted to do the right thing. He just wanted to sneak off somewhere and get married, but we insisted that we could be involved and they got married at my house, May the 20th of 2004. While Amanda's relationship with her stepmother blossomed, her relationship with her father became increasingly contentious. Me and him would always be mad at each other. We'd stay mad at each other about various things. She and father were basically doing what most parents and teenagers do, and that's war with each other over independence. And independence, in Amanda's case, meant the freedom to go out with boys. Even when she was 12, she liked the boys because we'd go on vacation. We'd have to watch her constantly because she's out looking for her boyfriend. I went on vacation with her, and she spent all this time with this guy. She was very, very boy crazy. 
When Amanda was in seventh grade, the struggle with Terry became serious enough to draw outside attention. Me and my friend was riding about the abuse I was going through, talking about how I wanted to run away, to get away from it. I was tired of it. Well, my teacher took up the letter and brought it to my counselor. Department of Children's Services here in Tennessee got involved immediately. They investigated, and then the investigation was closed, and it was said that it was unfounded. Were Amanda's allegations of abuse just preteen melodrama, or had the system failed to protect her? In spite of her troubles at home, over the next few years, Amanda grew into the typical teenager with a typical teen social life. I was too occupied with playing soccer and going to school and having going over to friends' house. We would talk on the phone for hours, and either I'd be over there or she'd be over at my house all the time. She had her share of boyfriends, too. I was in a relationship, and I thought I loved this guy. I thought I loved a lot of guys. She did have boyfriends. It's just a typical teenager. You know, they might change week to week, day to day. But she did, she did have boyfriends. That would change in May of 2007, when Amanda met her first serious boyfriend. She met him through a mutual friend. He said, he's really cool, and I was like, what's his name? He said, Andrew. At first glance, Andrew Mann wasn't exactly a heartthrob. He's a little wimpy-looking feller, and he's not didn't look healthy, and he's real pale and skinny. Andrew did have a few things going for him, however. He told her that he had money, and he was in construction business. He was his own boss. He had a new house, a motorcycle, a brand new car. He got me a very expensive ring. And it was real. I was with him when he got it. I was there when I pointed it out and everything. Within weeks of meeting, the young lovers were already talking marriage. I was so much in love with him. He busted out with, will you marry me? I only known the guy for two weeks, and I'm already sending a proposal to him. They almost immediately began expressing, you know, love to one another and the sun dying devotion. When Amanda introduced Andrew to her best friend, Rebecca Duggan, Rebecca wasn't impressed. I just felt like he wasn't a good boyfriend for my 15-year-old friend. Her objection? Technically, her 15-year-old friend's new boyfriend wasn't a boy. He was a 21-year-old man, which may have been why Amanda hid the relationship from her parents. Anytime a 21-year-old wants to date a 15-year-old, most parents are going to raise a few eyebrows and have concerns over that. Andrew expressed his own concerns after Amanda told him about the ongoing struggle with her father. He got really upset. He said, well, I'm taking you out of that house. He said, let's go run away together. Well, the next week, I ran away. Worried, Terry and Elisa filed a missing persons report. Then, a week after she disappeared, they received a call from Andrew Mann's grandmother. As it turned out, the couple had been staying with her just a few miles away from the McGee's home. His grandmother called my parents and said, we have your daughter here, and I'm sure you're looking for her. And yeah, so he had to bring me home. Amanda returned home, but not for long. On June 12th, she ran away with Andrew again. This time, she was only gone a few hours. Lisa calls Andrew and says, I know my daughter's with you. You gotta bring her home right now. If she's not here in 30 minutes, I will get a hold of you. Both y'all will be in jail. When Andrew finally drove Amanda home, Terry was waiting. I get home and my dad blocks Andy in the driveway and they have a very, very big argument. My stepmom put me in the house and she said, close the door, I don't want you to see this or hear this. Terry requested his driver's license and tag number, so if this were to happen again, it might end more quickly to where the police could get involved and track him down. After the confrontation, Elisa told her sister that she and Terry hoped it was the last they would see of Andrew Mann. My sister would tell me, I think we scared him and this won't happen again. On the afternoon of July 1st, just a few weeks after Terry and Andrew's driveway confrontation, Elisa's cousin came to the house looking for Elisa. There was a birth in the family, and everybody expected her to, to come visit. She didn't, so they went over to check on them. They looked through the window, and they actually saw Elisa McGee slumped over on the floor and then called police. 
Within minutes, sheriff's deputies were on the scene. Inside the house, they found both Elisa and Terry dead. Both victims have been shot. You have one victim laying in bed like he had been asleep, and another victim in the kitchen laying in the floor. And there was no major signs of a struggle or forced entry or anything like that. There was also no sign of 15-year-old Amanda. There was a juvenile daughter that was missing from the house. We were scared that something bad had happened to Amanda. That's what our thought was. I was telling them, Amanda's missing. Amanda's missing. They've done this to Terry and Elisa and, and kidnapped Amanda. Coming up. One of Amanda's friends has information that may help police find both Amanda and her parents' killer. I looked down the road and I just saw a bunch of police cars and I knew right away what had happened. At a little after three on the afternoon of July 1st, 2007, the yard outside Amanda McGee's Knoxville, Tennessee home was swarming with sheriff's cruisers and emergency vehicles. From Jolly Lane, where the house is, way back to Solway Road, was police cars and detectives and the sheriff and ambulance and the fingerprint people, just everybody. Law enforcement had been summoned by Amanda's relatives, who had dropped by the house to check on the family. Not telling them one. We had an emergency, please. It's a medical emergency? I, I don't know, honey. It must be worse than that because we can't get them to answer the phone, and that's why we went to see about them. Elisa McGee, Terry McGee, and Amanda McGee. Who is that? That's the people that live there. We were just worried about them because they wouldn't answer the phone, so we went to check. Dispatch received a call from one of the family members. She had gone to the residence and looked in the back window and saw Elisa laying in the kitchen floor. Moments later, they'd found Amanda's father, Terry, in the back bedroom. The door was closed, and one of us opened the door, and there was Terry. We were just in shock. They'd both been shot. From the position of Terry's body, police suspected he had been asleep. We found him laying on his side with a gunshot wound to the back of his head. He was facing away from the entrance to the room uh, toward the wall in the bed. Based on the crime scene, Elisa appeared to have been shot while trying to escape. Lisa McGee had been shot several times in the back. But who had pulled the trigger? There was no sign of forced entry or a struggle. There was not a lot of blood streaked through the house and, and things torn apart. It would have looked normal other than to have these two bodies. It was probably someone that they knew and they probably did not expect that it was going to happen but not necessarily a robbery. But if Terry and Elisa weren't shot during a robbery, what had happened? Could a kidnapping explain the killings and Amanda's absence? My sister, Linda, she said, something bad's happened to Amanda. I was thinking that they've done this to Terry and Elisa and, and kidnapped Amanda. At the crime scene that afternoon, Amanda's relatives filled the detectives in on the recent drama involving Amanda and her 21-year-old boyfriend, Andrew Mann. She ran away for a week with him, and she came back. Prior to the murders, there had been an incident in the driveway at uh, the McGee residence where uh, Andrew had brought Amanda back home. And Terry McGee had told Andrew in no uncertain terms to stay away from his daughter. Mr. McGee was threatening to report him um, for statutory rape. It was a very heated conversation. There was no doubt that Mr. McGee did not want this relationship to persist. Had Andrew responded with violence? That's certainly what Amanda's relatives suspected that afternoon at the house. 
they thought Andrew Mann had done this, and they were worried actually about Amanda. They were looking for Amanda to make sure that she was okay. Amanda's relatives weren't the only ones worried. The blue lights and emergency vehicles swarming around the house soon brought out the entire neighborhood. All the neighbors, of course, were, you know, out in the yard looking around. One of the neighbors outside the police cordon was Amanda's best friend, Rebecca Duggan. I looked down the road and I just saw a bunch of police cars and I knew right away what had happened. Rebecca came down and they, of course, stopped her. She couldn't get through, you know, for the other vehicles. That would change, however, as soon as police heard what Rebecca had to say. I just looked at the closest police officer and I just started rambling on. A young lady that lived up the street made contact with uh, the officers and the detectives and said that uh, she knew who probably did it because of prior conversations with Andrew Mann. Of course, this is going to raise the interest of law enforcement. And they questioned her, and she disclosed that Andrew had been talking about executing a plan just like the one that had happened. According to Rebecca, she'd first heard of the plan a few days before, not long after Andrew and Terry McGee had argued in the driveway. And she'd heard it from Andrew himself. He told me that he was going to have a couple friends come and take care of the bodies and take care of everything. After that, I was scared. I didn't know what to do. Rebecca not only revealed Andrew's role in the murders, she also told police where Andrew planned to take Amanda after he killed her parents. Andrew had told me where they were going to be staying, and I told the police what car he was in. I gave him a picture of Amanda. According to Rebecca, Andrew said he was staying with John Bassonsini, the father of a friend. My son came to me and said that Andrew had been kicked out of his grandmother's house, and I'm not going to let kids live on the street. By 7.30 that evening, law enforcement had surrounded the Bassonsini house. It was clear they weren't expected. Amanda and Andrew planning a cookout with friends on that afternoon. Amanda McGee was in the kitchen. Uh, Andrew Mann was in the kitchen. I was marinating steaks because I was going to put them on the grill. The cookout would be cut short. I heard somebody say, hey, is anybody home? I'm like, well, yeah, come on in. The front door's open. Next thing I know, I've got a group of police officers standing around me. Very polite men. Uh, asked for identification. The officers immediately handcuffed Andrew. They then turned their attention to Amanda. A lady officer grabbed Amanda and asked her for identification, and, well, I don't have any identification. And the officer asked her again. She says, I don't have any. She says, how old are you? Well, Amanda told her 15. Top of my head, like, come off. Andrew and Amanda were both taken into custody. And as the couple was hauled outside to the waiting police cruisers, one of the investigators turned to their host. I'm like, what's this about? He said, we can't disclose this at this point because it's, this is an ongoing investigation. And he asked some questions. John explained to the investigator that Amanda and Andrew had turned up on his doorstep Friday evening. Andrew came to me and asked if he and Amanda could stay there for a few days. I was told the, the young lady was 19 years old at that time. He said his son's friends could stay. My son vouched for him, so that was fine with me. John told the investigator he'd seen little else of Amanda and Andrew that Friday. Shortly after arranging their accommodations, the couple had gone out for the evening with his son and some other friends. That night, Andrew Mann, Amanda McGee went out for drinks, partying together and having fun with their friends. They seemed nothing was wrong. They seemed like everything was OK. They were very upbeat, like a young couple in love, uh, having fun together, playing, you know, bantering back and forth. And the fun had continued the next day with a motorcycle ride to the mountains and a shopping spree. It was probably seven or $800 worth of items, you know, Old Navy, so on and so forth. Sunday morning, the couple had also accompanied the Bassansani family to church. The sermon that day was out of, out of revelations. Little did the couple know that their blissful weekend together was about to end in a revelation of an entirely different sort. The news that Amanda had been found was quickly relayed back to Elisa's family at the crime scene. The police call and say, yes, we have apprehended them. We've got them both into custody. By this time, though, both the family and the police knew that Amanda was not Andrew Mann's victim. She was his accomplice. 
coming up. Was Amanda manipulated by her older boyfriend? Or was she the mastermind behind the murders? I was just feeling my guts out and it hurt so bad to have to tell the whole truth. By 7.30 on the evening of July 1st, 2007, Amanda McGee and Andrew Mann were already in police custody. Earlier that day, relatives had found Amanda's parents, Terry and Elisa McGee, murdered and discovered Amanda was missing. We were concerned about Amanda's safety. I didn't know if he had kidnapped her and killed my sister and brother-in-law. Police found both Andrew and Amanda at a friend's house, preparing for a cookout. All of a sudden, we hear a very loud pound, and he said, KPD, open up right now. We have a warrant for Andrew Brian Mann. And everybody's looking at Andrew like, why do you have a warrant for your arrest? The officers told Amanda they had to take her into custody, too. They said, we're going to take you down to the juvenile court for questioning. And I said, why are you handcuffing me and putting me in the back of a police car then? That's a malicious protocol. As Andrew and Amanda were put in separate police cars, investigators began searching for evidence at the house where the couple was arrested. Next thing I know, I've got a forensics team going through my house. You know, do you mind if we search it? The forensics team also searched Andrew's car parked outside. It didn't take them long to find what they were looking for. The murder weapon was inside the glove box in the car. The discovery appeared to confirm what Amanda's best friend, Rebecca Duggan, had already told investigators. According to Rebecca, Andrew told her about his plan to kill Amanda's parents. She also told police she knew where he had gotten the murder weapon because she had given it to him. It was the victim, Terrence McGee's gun. But how did Rebecca get Terry McGee's gun? According to Rebecca, it came from Amanda. She told detectives that the previous Wednesday, Amanda had asked her for a favor. She asked me to go pick Andrew up from the gas station. And she pulled out a Crown Royal bag and she put it in the passenger side seat, told me not to look in it. Rebecca said she didn't have to. When she made the handover, Andrew had told her what was inside. He picked it up and I asked him what was in it and he said a gun. So why hadn't Rebecca told anyone about the gun? According to Rebecca, she had tried. I knocked on the door and Amanda answered and I asked her if I could talk to Terry. And she said, what about? And I said, you know what it's about, Amanda. I'm not gonna let you kill your parents. She started crying and she looked very torn up. And she told me she would call the whole thing off. She didn't believe that they would really go through with it. That had changed as soon as she'd seen the blue lights around her best friend's house. When I looked down there and I saw all the police cars, all the people, all the family members, I just could not believe it. I didn't think it was real. The same realization was slowly dawning on Amanda's relatives. I heard Rebecca talking to the police and she said Amanda and Andrew Mann had done this. And I thought, it's unbelievable. I, she couldn't have done anything like this. She could not have done it. Obviously, Amanda's family did not think Amanda could have had anything to do with this. And I think it took a while to sink in what role she actually had in this. While Amanda was taken to a juvenile detention center, Andrew was ushered into an interrogation room at the Knox County Sheriff's Department. He didn't deny his role in the murders. He told detectives the plot was his idea. It was more so than it was her. But as the interrogation went on, it became clear that Amanda had been an active participant in the murders. What built up to that Friday? Did y'all discuss things? Went over there on Wednesday okay. to get together. Okay. She wanted me to do it on Thursday, but you know, I was like, well, I said, it's all risky, so you know, let's give it a day or two. Andrew also added a new wrinkle to the story. We found out two weeks ago she was pregnant. Okay. And she'll be in on the 4th of July. Okay. So uh, she was wanting to get out there before they found out, because if they found out, they'd press charges against me. 
According to Andrew, Terry McGee had threatened to do far more than report him to the police. All he kept on demanding is him ID, and he pulled a gun on me and said, listen, you're about to you're going to give me the information I want, and I'm going to shoot you. He said, he said, that's your two options. He said, now which one's it going to be? Upon learning she was pregnant, Andrew claimed he and Amanda had decided on a preemptive strike. They planned it for about a week. She stole her father's gun. Andrew told police he'd shown up at the McGee home on the morning of June 29th, armed with the same gun Terry had used to threaten him just two weeks earlier. He was let into the house by Amanda. She went back to her bedroom, which is straight back the hall. I told her, you know, turn the radio up just a little bit where she wouldn't hear nothing. Elisa McGee was at work, but Terry had been asleep in bed, according to Andrew. Went in there and started going around and get back in bed. But why did they also kill Elisa McGee? According to Andrew Mann, she would be a witness who could pinpoint them and maybe send them to jail. So when Elisa arrived home from work at 5.15 that afternoon, Andrew once again sent Amanda back to her bedroom while he confronted Elisa. She had the door closed. She came through and she saw me come through with the gun. I told him to sit down on the couch that we needed to talk. And her first words were, you know, you're gonna kill me. I told him, I'm sorry, I have to. Andrew Mann gave a full confession to law enforcement about killing Mr. and Mrs. McGee. But what about Amanda? When it was her turn to be questioned, she was initially much less forthcoming. In the beginning, you hear her not wanting to tell the whole story. Detectives tried to shake Amanda up by telling her that Andrew had already told them everything. When she heard that Andrew Mann had confessed to it, she broke down in tears and started telling her story. I cried for the rest of the interview because I was just feeling my guts out and it hurt so bad to have to tell the whole truth because it's going to come out one way or the other. Once she started talking, she corroborated everything Andrew had already told police. Basically, both of their stories were so that they could still be together. Sheriff's deputies booked them both for the murders of Terry and Elisa McGee. Andrew Mann was charged with two counts of first-degree murder. Only 15, Amanda was charged as a juvenile. We charge juveniles with delinquency by manner of whatever crime they've committed. Amanda McGee was charged with two counts of delinquency by first-degree murder. But would she be tried as a juvenile? Or would the prosecution attempt to have her tried as an adult? The prosecution will make a decision about whether they want to undergo what's called a transfer hearing and look at a host of factors that are probably pretty common sense, her age, the nature of the crime, and other factors such as that. In Amanda's case, the nature of the crime was stunning enough in its own right. Amanda and Andrew had actually got my sister's ID and credit card. They had gotten gas, and they went out to dinner that evening. In addition to that, the very next day, Amanda and Andrew went shopping. We went to Tanger Island Malls, and he bought me maternity stuff and stuff for the baby. They went to church on Sunday. They did remarkably normal things after killing two people. On July 3rd, Amanda sat down and wrote a letter to Andrew, who was being held without bail in the Knox County Jail. In some ways, it was a typical teenage love letter. Amanda McGee's letter was filled with statements of love for Andrew. Amanda's love was tinged with regret. Regret over Andrew's arrest. She wrote a letter that actually said, I hope you don't have to stay in jail a long time. And then she said, you know, you may be 99 before you get out of jail. Don't worry, I'll wait for you, and I'll come to visit you. According to the letter, Amanda clearly expected she'd get out of jail soon. I remember writing, talking about how I'm going to get out when I turn 18 and all this other stuff. She was only 15, and she naturally assumed for her that that meant that she was just going to spend a little time in juvenile and that she was going to go home. Amanda's astonishing statements didn't stop there either. She actually said, I'm not sorry that it happened. I'm sorry that we got caught. On July 13th, the prosecutors filed to have Amanda McGee charged and tried as an adult. The prosecution sought permission from the court to treat her as an adult because of the nature of these crimes. 
coming up. Will the court decide Amanda can be tried as an adult? The judge had been crying because his face was really red and it looked like his eyes were wet. And he was like, Miss McGee, may you stand? And at trial, Andrew Mann takes the stand and explains his motive for murdering the McGees. She kept on insisting. She said, well, baby, she said, if you love me, you're going to do this. On February 25th, 2008, bailiffs led Amanda McGee before the judge who would decide whether she would be tried as an adult for her parents' murders. She had been held at the juvenile detention center for seven months with no family willing to post bond. I was scared. I was very scared. I was depressed. Very, very, very depressed. We were at a real, you know, struggle with our feelings because, that, you know, we cared about her and, and loved her and she was part of our family. Amanda was also eight months pregnant. I felt sorry for her. She was ready to have that baby just about. And I thought, oh, my, a young lady messing up her life like this. It was very hard. It was, uh, she was such a child and so immature. Uh, I didn't know what to do do about that, but there wasn't anything I could do about it. It was not up to me. Instead, the decision of whether or not to try Amanda as an adult rested with a judge. There was a lot riding on the outcome. If held and charged as a juvenile, the maximum punishment she could have faced would have been four years in the custody of, of children's services. For an adult, first-degree murder carried a far stiffer penalty. The potential maximum penalty would be life without parole. On February 26, both sides made their closing statements. Judge Irwin said, well, let's close for a five minute recess for let me to make it my decision. Well, I looked at my attorney and I said, what's going on? And she's like, oh, you're fine, you're fine. I, I'm, I feel very good about this. When the judge came back, it was clear that his decision had not been made lightly. I could tell he had been crying in those five minutes because his face was really red and it looked like his eyes were wet. And he was like, Miss McGee, may you stand? His decision, Amanda would be tried as an adult. He was like, Miss McGee, I know you're a very good lady. You have no prior criminal record, but due to the evidence that I have, I have no choice but to send you to adult court. With well, a second he said adult, I screamed and I fell back into the chair. Things changed dramatically for her when the prosecution won its effort to treat her as an adult. Two weeks later on March 14th, Amanda gave birth to a baby girl. The baby was given up for state custody. It was put into foster care and ultimately the foster parents adopted the baby. December 1st, 2008, a year and a half after Amanda McGee's parents had been found dead, her boyfriend, Andrew Mann, stood trial for their murders. I walked in the door of trial really wondering what his defense would be. There was no doubt that there was some premeditation involved. Andrew had confessed as much in a statement he made the night of his arrest. He gave a very damning confession. And of course, the facts are pretty chilling. Yet despite his confession, Andrew had pled not guilty to both charges of first-degree murder. A lot of times in a murder case when it goes to trial, it's simply a disagreement over what level of killing was it. In her opening statement, the prosecutor argued that everything about the crime was premeditated. The father was killed about 11, 11.30 in the morning. They did leave the residence and ride around, go get something to eat. When they came back, about 4, 4.30, they went inside the house and waited for her to arrive. I think a court would have a um, very difficult time finding that there was anything but calculation going on in that time frame. To underscore the calculated nature of the crime, the prosecutors played excerpts of Andrew's taped confession for the jury. I'm sorry, I have to. Particularly with the stepmother, in that death, uh, it was almost a cakewalk in terms of premeditation. When it was the defense's turn, Andrew's attorney didn't dispute that the killings had been premeditated. However, he did argue that it wasn't Andrew who did most of the planning. Andrew Mann's uh, defense team was trying to blame it on Amanda McGee's side, saying, well, she was the one that really was the brains of the operation. She's the one that coerced him to do it. 
According to the defense, Amanda had admitted as much in her jailhouse letter to Andrew. She wrote down exactly what she did. She acknowledged what she did. I'm sorry, I made you do that. That letter actually was a key piece of evidence for the defense. The letter was also the perfect setup for Andrew to take the stand in his own defense on December 4th. You think of someone that could do something like this would be just a monster. But he was just a naive young man that was very immature. He came across as weepy and weak, and perhaps you could see how he might be manipulated by a teenage girl. And by Andrew's account, he was easily manipulated. Andrew Mann's defense was that he was a very socially awkward, nerdy kind of guy who had never had the affection of, of a young lady. Amanda hadn't been just any young lady either. According to Andrew, she'd made herself out to be a regular damsel in distress. She kept on insisting. She said, well, baby, she said, if you love me, you're going to do this. He felt like he didn't have a choice, that he was trying to protect his girlfriend. And who did Andrew think he was protecting Amanda from? Her abusive father. He said that Amanda had told him these lies about his, her father. I told Andrew all of it. Uh, every single detail of what happened between me and Terry. And then he really, really snapped. He said, I, he said, well, what do you want me to do? I said, do something. And I guess he twisted my words around and thought I meant literally get rid of him. Andrew's defense had evidence that Amanda had made the accusation before. In fact, three years before meeting Andrew, Amanda and Terry had both been interviewed by the Department of Children's Services. They had nothing to back up these abuse claims. The only word that anyone had that any of this had gone on came from Amanda. They came to my school and interviewed me, and they notified bruises and took notes of everything, and they recorded my conversation with them. They had promised me they'd do a follow-up, a random follow-up check out of nowhere to come to the house, and they never did that. And I feel as though that I lost the reason I have a very big trust issue is because of DCS. Even if the allegation was true, did it excuse the crime? In closing arguments on the morning of December 5th, the prosecutor stressed to the jurors that Andrew was on trial for two murders. They didn't stop with murdering her father, this alleged abuser. Nine hours later, they murdered her stepmother. The case went to the jury just before noon. And unlike the nine long hours Andrew and Amanda spent waiting to ambush Elisa, it wouldn't take the jury long to come back with a verdict. They didn't stay out more than 30 or 40 minutes. The jury did not take a lot of time uh, to decide the case, get, particularly given those two counts of first degree murder. The jury found Andrew Mann guilty on both counts. He was sentenced to receive two life sentences. When Amanda heard the news, she had very different feelings from the ones she had expressed in her letter a year and a half earlier. I didn't make him commit those murders. He was six years older than me. He had the maturity, supposedly the maturity level, to know that he should have been the older one and the wiser one to say, no, this is stupid. You're stupid for even thinking about something like that. He got two life sentences, which was 102 years. Amanda was absolutely knee deep in every aspect of this. She was facing the possibility of two counts of life without the possibility of release. But the 17 year old hadn't come to court that morning to face a jury. Instead, she'd come hoping to avoid one. She pleaded guilty to two counts of second degree, degree murder. It shocked my whole family because my whole family was there expecting a trial. If anyone had a shot at getting sympathy from a jury, it would have been Amanda. So it was a surprise when she pleaded guilty. In exchange for the plea, Amanda agreed to a 45-year sentence. I looked at my attorney and I said, well, here you are telling me we've been doing a lot of time in prison. I said, that's a long time, but not as much time as you've been saying I was going to have. And I said, well, let's take it. I was very relieved that she pled guilty because I knew if she didn't, that she would be found guilty. And she probably got a lot less time for pleading guilty. For Elisa McGee's family, it was a relief not to have to sit through another trial. It was so bad. 
to go through his trial, and I just hated to have to do that. It's the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, and listen to that for a whole week. After all, the confessed murderer standing before the judge was still the little girl they'd known and loved. I wanted Amanda to have a break. I didn't think she deserved a life sentence. We're satisfied. Whatever punishment that she received is not going to change what has happened or bring my sister or Terry back. So we were just happy that she did receive the punishment that she did. As for Amanda, she is no longer the 15-year-old girl whose only regret was getting caught. I know now that if I was halfway thinking that this wouldn't happen. And I know this isn't possible, but I want some kind of sign from Lisa that she forgives me.